Sophie Toscan de Plantier traveled from France to her holiday home in Ireland, hoping to rest and relax before Christmas. Three days later, her neighbor found her lying on the ground outside. She had been brutally beaten to death. But despite bragging about committing the murder, her killer remains a free man to this day. This is Monsters. On December 19, 1996, Sophie Toscan de Plantier and her husband, Daniel Toscan de Plantier, were attending a Christmas party in Paris. It was held at Le Bon Douche, a popular Paris venue, and hosted by Unifrance, an organization that promoted French films. Daniel, who was renowned as a film producer, was Unifrance's chairman. Sophie had also worked for Unifrance in the past, before she left to follow her dream of producing television documentaries. The couple spent the night talking to guests, including influential filmmakers and actors. Several of the people that Sophie talked to at the party remembered that while she seemed full of life and optimistic about her career, she told them that she was exhausted. She'd only just come home from Acapulco, where she had been attending a film festival. To recover from her stressful time away, Sophie had decided to travel to her cottage in West Cork, Ireland for a few days of rest. Sophie had grown up in France, but as a teenager, she and her family had regularly traveled to Ireland for vacations. As an adult, Sophie still had a deep love for Ireland, and in 1993, she decided to buy a cottage in West Cork to use as a holiday home for her and her second husband. The cottage was on an isolated piece of land, located in a town known for a quiet life surrounded by rolling green hills and miles of pasture. Sophie quickly became a regular visitor to the cottage. She often traveled there with her son or invited her friends to stay, but this time, none of the family or friends she invited were able to come. It was too close to Christmas, and everybody had already made other plans. Eventually, Sophie had decided that she would travel alone and return back to France in time to celebrate Christmas. It wasn't as if she would be completely isolated. She had gotten to know several of the locals in the area who recognized her and her son whenever they visited. The day after the party, Sophie got up early and drove to the Charles de Gaulle airport, then flew to Cork via Dublin. Cork Airport's security footage showed her arriving just before 2.30 p.m., picking up her luggage and then picking up the keys to a rental car. Two hours later, she arrived at the cottage, which could be accessed by a lane behind a large metal gate. The gate had to be kept closed at all times because there was sheep grazing in the pastures behind the house. There were two other houses next to Sophie's, but one of them was a holiday home. The only permanent residents were Alfie Lyons and Shirley Foster, who had lived in the house on the left-hand side. Whenever Sophie was away from the cottage, she hired a local woman, Josephine Heller, to take care of the property for her. Josephine made a point of making the cottage welcoming whenever Sophie visited, lighting the fireplaces so the house would be warm. This time, she had even decorated the cottage for Christmas with bunches of holly. On the morning of December 23, 1996, Sophie's neighbor Shirley sprinted out of her car and ran back to her house. She was out of breath and pale, but managed to tell Alfie, quote, There's a body by the gate. Alfie ran towards the gate on foot, but when he saw the blood, he came to a stop about 100 feet or 30 meters away. He wasn't able to see the body clearly, but a gut feeling told him that it belonged to his neighbor Sophie. Alfie ran towards Sophie's house and knocked on the door as loud as he could, but after getting no response, he went back to his house and called the police. Two officers arrived at the scene just past 10.30 a.m. Sophie was lying on her back, dressed in white pants and a t-shirt, which were soaked through with blood. Her left leg had gotten stuck on a piece of barbed wire from the fence, which had caused her leggings to tear. Her dressing gown had either come off or been removed, and it was lying on the ground next to her. One of the officers began to document the scene. It was clear from Sophie's injuries that she had fought hard against her attacker. Her forearms and hands were covered with defensive wounds, she had broken one of her fingers, and she was holding a handful of human hair in one hand. She had died still clenching her fists, holding on to the clump of hair. There was a blood stain on the metal gate, indicating that Sophie had tried to flee by opening the gate and running from her attacker, but she was overpowered before she was able to. 
Half an hour later, a doctor arrived to examine Sophie's remains. He was quickly able to pronounce her dead. She had suffered extensive injuries to her head and her body was stiff with rigor mortis. A nine-inch cinder block covered in blood was lying next to her body. Investigators believed that it was the murder weapon because Sophie's face and head wounds suggested that she had been repeatedly forcefully struck with a heavy object. She had lost so much blood from her head wounds that a pool had formed around her neck and head. At 12.30, the housekeeper's husband arrived to identify Sophie's body. A police photographer arrived to carefully capture images of the scene, photographing every piece of evidence individually and taking close-up shots of each of the wounds on Sophie's body. The rest of the lane, the garden, and the inside of the cottage were examined painstakingly. As the investigators searched for any evidence the perpetrator might have left behind, a fingerprint, a strand of hair, a drop of blood. Despite news of Sophie's death spreading like wildfire throughout West Cork, her husband Daniel and the rest of her family members hadn't been informed. The guard I had attempted to make contact with Sophie's family by informing the French police about the murder, but for some reason, news of Sophie's death still hadn't reached her loved ones. Instead, at 8 p.m., Sophie's mother, Marguerite, was watching the news when she saw a report that a French woman had been murdered just outside Cork City, Ireland. Marguerite was instantly struck by a strong gut feeling. She knew that the anonymous woman who had been killed was Sophie. Marguerite called her sister Marie to share her concerns. Marie was very close to Sophie, but she hadn't heard from her that day. Both women placed several calls to Sophie's holiday house, but there was no answer. At that point, Sophie had been dead for almost 24 hours, and her body had been discovered more than 12 hours prior. Marie's daughter, Alexandra, joined her aunt and mother and began desperately calling people in Ireland who might know about the case. She ended up contacting one of the investigators who had been there when Sophie's body was found, but he was legally unable to tell her whether the victim was Sophie. After being turned down by the investigator, Alexandra made one final call. She called the housekeeper, Josephine. Alexandra had actually met Josephine several times because the woman had been there when Alexandra had stayed with her cousin in Ireland. By that point, Alexandra was desperate. She told Josephine that she didn't need details. She just wanted a yes or no answer to one question. Is Sophie alive? Josephine was silent for a moment and then whispered, no. From there, the news spread quickly. Alexandra told her sister, who told their mother, who then broke the news to Sophie's mother and father. The family were able to reach Sophie's husband and broke the news to him that Sophie had been killed. Sophie's body had been kept at the scene of the crime for 24 hours, covered with a sheet of blue plastic. The investigation continued into the morning of December 24th while a rotation of the guard eye remained on the property at all times. It was a festive tradition in some West Cork families to light a candle overnight as a way of welcoming the household into Christmas morning. Instead, the guard I were spending the day before Christmas watching over the body of a high-profile woman, knowing that her killer was still at large. Early on Christmas Eve, Dr. John Harbison, the local pathologist, arrived to carry out a brief examination and then supervise as Sophie's body was moved into a coffin and then transported 74 miles or 120 kilometers from the cottage to the morgue. At 2 p.m., Dr. Harbison's examination of Sophie's remains began. He came to the same conclusion as the first responders. Sophie's cause of death was clearly massive trauma to her head and face, which had been inflicted by a blunt instrument and resulted in a fractured skull. Sophie's parents, brother, and Aunt Marie flew to Cork to view Sophie's body. Her brother Bertrand was the first family member to enter the morgue. The family had been informed about the extent of Sophie's injuries, and they tried to prepare themselves, but when Bertrand walked back out of the morgue, he was visibly disturbed. His sister's face had been so severely damaged that he could barely recognize her, telling his family, quote, That's not Sophie. When Marguerite viewed the body, she only noticed one part that she recognized as belonging to her daughter, Sophie's nose, which had miraculously not been damaged in the attack. She asked if she would be able to move the sheet and see Sophie's hands one last time, but the doctor convinced her not to. Sophie's hands had also been severely wounded, and one of her fingers was suspected to be broken. Sophie's husband Daniel made the decision that he would not fly to Cork. Instead, he quietly traveled to his property in Ombax, where he worked on arranging Sophie's funeral services. He would later say, quote, 
I knew the extent of Sophie's injuries from conversations with the police and I could not bear to have remembered her as anything but the beautiful, vibrant woman that I knew and loved. I would have been haunted by the mutilation of her face and it would have obliterated the wonderful memories of her smiles. Sophie was buried in a small graveyard close to the country home in Ombax where Daniel had traveled after her death. But the investigation was still ongoing and investigators were beginning to suspect that there was no true connection between Sophie and her killer. Rumors had begun to appear in the newspaper that Sophie had invited her killer inside for a glass of wine, because two empty wine glasses had been left in the kitchen. In fact, the reports of the wine glasses were false, and there was nothing at the scene of the crime to suggest that the killer had been anything but a stranger. It seemed to be the most difficult type of murder to solve, a random act of violence perpetrated by a total stranger. A superintendent spoke to a French newspaper about the investigation, saying, quote, we know nothing yet of what happened in the house between the moment when the victim telephoned her husband on Sunday at 11 o'clock and the time when her neighbor found her body on Monday morning at 10.30. What we do know is that Miss Toscan was brought down at the barrier that borders her property, murdered by a weapon capable of inflicting wounds, a poker, a tool, a stone, or a piece of wood. We are looking for it. In the house, the lights were off. We found no trace of a struggle, nothing disturbed. The door was locked. It would be impossible for anyone to re-enter as the keys were on the inside of the door. She had suffered no sexual assault. The guard I had pieced together an exact timeline of Sophie's movements before her death, beginning when she got off the plane at the Cork airport and drove away in her rental car. They looked at the mileage of the rental car. It was consistent with a long drive from the airport and small trips around town, with no unexplained journeys anyway. All witness reports told the same story. Sophie had been alone in West Cork, and while she was friendly with the locals, she had a reputation for being reserved and didn't seek out companionship from anyone but her family. There was no sign that there was anyone in West Cork that Sophie would have invited into her home late at night. And while Sophie wasn't close with many of the locals, she was well-liked, and nobody that the guard I talked to could think of anybody who would have motive to kill her. Investigators quickly ruled out the possibility that Sophie had been killed by somebody who had followed her from France to Ireland. Instead, they began to narrow down the search, focusing on suspects who lived in West Cork. Forty detectives worked around the clock on the case, carrying out house-to-house -house interviews and distributing thousands of questionnaires to nearby neighborhoods. They analyzed samples of clothing and hair from locals and, one by one, validated hundreds of alibis for the night that Sophie died. From the very beginning of the investigation, Daniel had issues with how the case was handled. It began with the family never being officially informed of Sophie's murder and the communication problems between the guard eye, the French police, and Sophie's family never improved. Daniel alleged that he wasn't kept up to date on the progress of the investigation. Meanwhile, he was under a huge amount of scrutiny from the media, which speculated that Daniel and Sophie's marriage had been under strain. It didn't help that Daniel and Sophie had separated in the past, including an instance where Sophie had reportedly brought another man to stay with her at the cottage in West Cork. The media coverage of the case was brutal for those close to Sophie, but the world was fascinated by the case, and out of all of the reporters and journalists who zeroed in on Sophie's murder, none of them would become as significant to the case as journalist Ian Bailey. Ian was born in Manchester in 1957 and grew up as an intelligent, high-achieving child. At first, his journalism career went from strength to strength. He started out as a trainee in Gloucester and eventually decided that he wanted to work for himself as a freelancer, including opening his own freelancing agency. He operated the agency in Cheltenham, England for eight years, working with TV stations and high-profile tabloids such as the Sunday Times, the Telegraph, and the Daily Mirror. Then, his marriage to his wife, Sarah Limbrick, who worked in the same industry, dissolved, and Ian lost his passion for the job and decided he needed a fresh start. That fresh start involved relocating his entire life to West Cork in 1991. He worked at a fish factory and then as a gardener and finally decided that he wanted to give journalism another shot. He made connections with people in the local media and slowly began to climb the ladder again. In December of 1996, when news of Sophie's murder broke, a correspondent for the Cork Examiner asked Ian to help with the local coverage of the case. Ian provided the Cork Examiner with everything they needed for a good story, data, local information, and several reputable contacts in the area. 
He also reached out to other media outlets, including the Paris Match and the Irish Star, providing them additional information about the murder. On February 10, 1997, the Gardai arrived at Ian Bailey's home and arrested him before taking him to the station for questioning. They suspected that he knew more than just the information he'd given to the media. In fact, they thought that he was involved in Sophie's murder himself. His partner, Jules Thomas, was also arrested. They were interrogated for a total of 10 hours before both were released without being charged with any crimes. The following year, Ian was arrested a second time and taken into the same station for further questioning about Sophie's murder. Just like before, he was released without being charged. In the days after Sophie was killed, Ian's co-workers and friends had noticed that he had several mysterious injuries. He had an abrasion on his forehead as well as a collection of deep scratches on both his forearms. During questioning, he was asked how he got those injuries. Ian responded casually, saying that he had been scratched on December 22nd while cutting down a tree for Christmas. However, several people had seen Ian on that day and they hadn't noticed any scratches on him at the time. Investigators tried to corroborate Ian's story by cutting down Christmas trees in a variety of ways. They were unable to create conditions that would result in the kind of long, narrow scratches that Ian had received. Ian's alibi was as difficult to confirm as his story about his injuries. In the initial statements that the couple gave to Gardai, both Ian and his partner Jules said the same thing. Ian had spent the entire night in bed and hadn't left the bedroom at any point. But in the next set of interviews, the stories stopped lining up. Jules retracted the initial statement and said that Ian hadn't actually stayed in bed all night. In fact, he'd gotten up at around 11 p.m. and not returned to bed until 9 the next morning, when he reappeared with a mysterious wound on his forehead. Ian also changed his story to a completely different version of events, saying he'd stayed in bed until 4 in the morning, then gotten up to work on an article for half an hour before going back to bed. Being arrested in connection with the case might not have caused any legal consequences for Ian, but the damage to Ian's reputation was devastating. From the moment he was first arrested in February of 1997, articles appeared in the tabloids speculating about whether he was Sophie's killer. Some of them were media outlets he'd worked for in the past. Now he was on the front page. When he was arrested a second time, the media attention grew even greater. Nobody knew any details about why Ian was a suspect, but it seemed that the Gardai had reason to believe that he was the killer. In 2000, two different women were questioned by authorities about Sophie's murder, but both of them were released the same day. Then, on September 24th, the Sunday Times reported on an update in the case, stating that new evidence had led to a breakthrough in the investigation. The article said that two people had come forward to the police, sharing that the year after Sophie was killed, they had been drinking in the local pub with a man they hadn't met before. The man brought up Sophie's death, and without prompting, he launched into a detailed discussion about the murder. He was so enthusiastic about the conversation that the two witnesses became very uncomfortable and ended up reporting the encounter to the guard eye. The man the couple met at the pub was Ian Bailey. In case you've missed it, my other channel has rebranded to Sinister. We're expanding with multiple shows, which will include Somewhere Sinister, our new show Someone Sinister, and eventually Something Sinister. You can follow the link above or in the description and check out some sinister stories. Seven years after Sophie's murder, Ian took action against the media outlets that he believed had slandered his name. In December of 2003, the libel hearing began. Ian's lawyer, James Duggan, began by describing the case against the eight different newspapers. He told the court about the negative impact of the articles on Ian's life, which he described as a living nightmare that caused Ian to be shunned by society. He described how Ian had been repeatedly questioned and had samples taken from his hair, clothing, and blood. Despite all of that being collected, Ian was never charged. Duggan said, quote, Within his own community, he is referred to as the murderer. He has been persecuted and victimized. He has been living a horror story. But he lives with just one hope. A hope that, someday, someone may be tried for this horrific crime. The lawyer insisted that Ian was not striking back at the newspapers for fame or financial gain. He simply wanted to clear his name and make sure that the rest of the world knew that he was not the murderer. After making the purpose of the libel case clear, Duggan went on to describe how Ian had become involved with Sophie's case in the first place. 
He alleged that, even though Ian had been the first journalist on the scene, he'd actually only seen Sophie once before. He had been over at a neighbor's house when the neighbor had pointed at Sophie through the window and told Ian who she was. Sophie had been more than 100 meters away at the time and the two had never properly met. In his own words, Ian described how he ended up covering the case, saying that the phone call he got from the Cork Examiner was how he found out there'd been a murder in the first place. He said, quote, I received a phone call from Eddie Cassidy shortly before lunch. I was asked if I could maybe find out about the incident. He said there had been a murder and that it involved a foreign national. It was thought the person may have been French. On the second day of the hearing, Ian was asked about the first time he was arrested in connection with the case, February 10, 1997. He alleged that while he had been shocked to be arrested, the guard I had been cordial and relaxed with him, until they got him handcuffed in the patrol car. Immediately, the atmosphere changed and Ian believed that the guard I had been trying to intimidate him into confessing to the crime. At one point, Ian said an officer had told him that the guard I had cast iron evidence that was going to put him away for life. During the ride to the police station, he reported that another officer said, quote, You could be found dead with a bullet in the back of the head. Ian told the court that, the day after he was first arrested, an article was published by the Irish Sun declaring that he was a suspect in Sophie's murder. From then on, the media coverage had snowballed, and soon, photographs of him were being published by the local and international media. He described agreeing to interviews with reporters who promised to paint him in a sympathetic light, only to read the published articles and find out that they were also condemning him. James Duggan knew there was one point he had to address before the defense had the chance. Ian Bailey's criminal record. In 1996 and 2001, Ian had been arrested for domestic violence. Both times, the victim was his long-term partner, Jules Thomas. Duggan decided that it was best to give Ian the opportunity to talk about those arrests in an upfront way and asked him to share his story with the court. Ian responded, quote, It is to my eternal regret that during our 13 years together, we have had three fights, but I accept full responsibility for what happened. I hurt her and I admitted it. He blamed the fights on a lot of pressure from external forces. During cross-examination, Paul Gallagher SC pointed out that the arrests hadn't been due to quote-unquote fighting. They had been due to Ian inflicting significant physical damage on Jules, including a laceration in her mouth that needed eight stitches, a black eye, deep bite marks, and large chunks of her hair being ripped from her scalp. To prove his point, Gallagher shared segments from Ian's personal diaries with the court. As soon as he began reading, the court fell silent and the mood in the courtroom began to shift. Two weeks after the first time he was arrested for attacking Jules, Ian had written, quote, I actually tried to kill her. I feel a sense of sickness at seeing my own account of the attack that night. I am an animal on two feet. When confronted with his own diary entries detailing his vicious attack on Jules and his history of violence towards women, Ian responded that the diary entries were abstract venting, and not a true reflection of events. From the beginning, Ian had insisted that everyone who said he was involved with the murder was lying. On the fourth day of the trial, he was systematically confronted with a sizable list of people who claimed that Ian had admitted to murdering Sophie himself. Helen Callahan, who worked for the Sunday Tribune as a news editor, alleged that she had mentioned to Ian that the media was suggesting that he was the killer, to which Ian replied, quote, Oh yes. Ian admitted that this conversation had taken place, but insisted that he had been joking, and thought Helen understood that he wasn't being serious. Another woman, Yvonne Ungerer, reported that Ian had also told her that he'd murdered Sophie, specifying that he had done it by hitting her with a concrete block. Once again, Ian admitted that he'd said those things, but that he'd been joking. He explained, quote, I was just reiterating my conversation with Miss Callahan to Miss Ungerer. I didn't think she took it seriously. Bill Fuller, a West Cork local, had described a bizarre conversation he'd had with Ian shortly after the murder. According to Bill, Ian had started talking about the case in the second person, saying, quote, Yes, you did it, didn't you? You saw her in spar and she turned you on, walking up the aisle with her tight arse. You went there to see what you could get, but she wasn't interested. You chased her and then stirred something in the back of your head, and then you went a lot further than you intended. In 1998, Ian and Jules hosted a New Year's Eve party. Several guests had become uncomfortable because Ian spent a large amount of time enthusiastically showing them his scrapbook, 
which contained all the details of Sophie's murder case. Two of their guests, the Shelleys, had initially planned on staying at Ian's place overnight, but they became so unsettled that they decided to leave early. Right before they walked out of the house, Ian allegedly followed them into the hallway saying, quote, I did it, I did it, I went too far. When he was confronted with that story in court, Ian responded that he hadn't been confessing to the murder. He had just been repeating a mantra that the guard I had said to him during one of his interviews. A 14-year-old boy, Malachi Reed, reported that he had been offered a ride by Ian, and during the drive, Ian told him that he had murdered Sophie by bashing her head in with a rock. Ian admitted that he'd discussed the case with Malachi, but denied that he had confessed to being the killer. He said it was just a topic of conversation. Basically, all of these people had just misunderstood Ian when he spoke about murdering Sophie. Three different West Cork locals reported that on December 23rd, Ian had told them that a big story or a murder had taken place, even though at that point, Sophie hadn't even been killed yet. Ian claimed that those witnesses had their times wrong, sticking with his story that he hadn't known about the murder until the Cork examiner called him. The prosecution suggested that Ian had actually been actively seeking out publicity for his involvement in the crime, because he agreed to both TV and radio interviews immediately after his arrest. During one of those interviews, he even said, because of the scratches on his hands the night Sophie died, the guard I were quite reasonable to view him as a suspect. Ian denied those accusations, insisting that he had shied away from publicity. On the hearing's eighth day, a reluctant witness came forward with new information. Her name was Marie Farrell, and she worked as a shopkeeper in West Cork. She shared that, two days before the hearing began, she had received a threatening anonymous phone call where a woman had told her, quote, keep your bloody mouth shut. Then, Marie began to share a story about her encounters with Ian since Sophie's murder. She told the court that Ian had been trying to threaten her into retracting one of the statements that she'd made to the guard eye, a statement that completely contradicted his alibi for that night. Marie had told the guard eye that she had seen a tall man in a dark coat who was kind of distinctive looking on December 23, 1996, walking close to the cottage where Sophie lived. However, she didn't recognize that man until months later when she saw him again and asked who he was. After finding out that the man was named Ian Bailey, she immediately went to the guard eye and reported that she had seen him walking by Sophie's house the night of the murder. Over and over, Ian had told his lawyers and law enforcement that he had been home all night with Jules on the 23rd. Even when he changed his story and admitted to getting up in the middle of the night, he insisted that he'd stayed inside the house to write an article. Marie might have been a stranger to Ian, but after he found out about the statement she had made, he and Jules began making her life a living hell. Shortly after Marie made the statement, she was approached by Jules who told her, quote, Ian wants to meet you. Another time, Jules invited Marie over to the couple's house, telling her that she needed to get a recording of Marie admitting that the statement had been coerced by the guard eye. At one point, Ian arrived at Marie's shop with a tape recorder insisting that she needed to, quote, say that the guard I were forcing her to make a false statement. According to Marie, Ian was paranoid that the shop was being bugged and his demeanor made her extremely nervous. She told the court that she thought he could kill her in two minutes. Then, Ian became more threatening, correctly telling Marie the address where her partner lived in London and several previous addresses where Marie had lived before she moved to her current home. He told Marie that he expected her to make a statement within a specific time period, and that she should contact him when it was done. When Marie didn't follow through, Ian repeatedly came to her shop, threatening to reveal information about her. Once, he yelled at her, quote, I know you saw me, but I did not kill Sophie. When he saw her in public, he would make cutthroat gestures or hold his finger to his temple, miming shooting a gun. Marie told the court, quote, I ended up in debt because I was so afraid to stay in my shop because of Ian Bailey. I was afraid to let my children out because of him. It was awful. When the hearing was over, both sides waited three weeks for the conclusion. In January of 2004, the judge ruled that Ian Bailey was a violent person who had repeatedly lied during the hearing, coming to the conclusion that none of the newspapers were guilty of defamation. The judge said, quote, in reference to Mr. Bailey's objection to the newspapers referring to him as a violent man, I would have no hesitation in describing Mr. Bailey as a violent man. The defendants were perfectly justified in describing him as violent towards women. He has not been defamed by that. 
Throughout the hearing and during his ruling verdict, the judge repeated that although it was about a murder, it wasn't a murder trial. It was a defamation case. Ian failing to prove that he was the victim of defamation didn't mean that he had failed to prove he was innocent of Sophie's murder and, once the ruling was over, he remained a free man. In early 2010, a French magistrate issued a European arrest warrant for Ian Bailey, and Ireland's High Court agreed to grant an extradition order. French law states that, if a French citizen is murdered overseas, the French have jurisdiction over the crime, no matter where in the world the murder occurred. Ian appealed the extradition order to the Irish Supreme Court, and two years later, his appeal was granted. The European arrest warrant led to Ian being arrested in Ireland in 2017, and the French court ruled that he should be tried in absentia. More than two decades after Sophie Toscan de Plantier was killed, the Cour de Cies in Paris convicted Ian Bailey of murder in absentia, and sentenced him to 25 years in prison. In October of 2020, Ireland's High Court ruled that Ian was unable to be extradited for the crime, because Ireland didn't recognize the French laws that led to his conviction. At that moment, all efforts to extradite Ian were extinguished. Ian is now in his late 60s. He is still in West Cork, making a living selling food at the local farmer's market. Several times, when Sophie's son Pierre has returned to West Cork to honor his mother's memory, he has been forced to come face to face with the monster who murdered his mother. The night that she died, Sophie had been reading a book of Yeats' poetry. It was left open in her bedroom, showing the last page that she had read, a poem called A Dream of Death. I dreamed that one had died in a strange place, near no accustomed hand, and they had nailed the boards above her face, the peasants of that land. Wondering to lay her in that solitude and raised above her mound, a cross they had made out of two bits of wood and planted cypress round, and left her to the indifferent stars above until I carved these words. She was more beautiful than thy first love, but now lies under boards. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.